Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Doug. I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be an alcoholic and grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the uh, reason I say that, just to piss off the newcomers, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's, you know, I, I, I do remember that the first time I heard somebody say, I'm a grateful alcoholic, I thought, and you are a moron. You're, I, uh, <laughs> and what an exciting life you must have that the best thing going on for you is you get to join AA. Woo! <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the fact is, uh, I'm absolutely positive that, that my life today is better because I'm an alcoholic than it would have been if I hadn't been an alcoholic. I, I'm the only alcoholic in my immediate family, as far as I know, and uh, I'd rather be me than any of them. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that as a, uh, a, as a condemnation of anybody in my family. I, I, just, I come from this great family. I mean, my, uh, I just, uh, uh, I would just... Uh, I would just rather be me. My my family, I come from this family. I'm the oldest of four kids. I'm the only boy. And uh, uh, so I, I guess I was kind of treated with a, with a little extra, you know, something. Uh, um, Kathy mentioned it, you know, the the oldest and the, and, and the one that was always getting in trouble. And, um, uh, you know, <laughs> my, my family uh, always loved me. Uh, I come from this happy, hardworking, musical family. Not professional musicians, just a musical family. People played instruments. We we sang, uh, and uh, you know that's just a. We we had uh, we lived in in a sort of a rural area of Orange County in California, just near Disneyland. Uh, so it wasn't uh, wasn't out in the sticks. You know, it wasn't a farm, uh, but we had. We had about an acre, and, and people around us had. My sisters had horses. Uh, we raised chickens, not for, not for profit. We just, I don't know. My parents need, thought we needed chickens. I don't know. I, you know, uh, if I wanted to go out on a Saturday afternoon, I had to clean the horse stalls. We had my dad built ten uh, stalls and rented them out to people who had horses. And if I wanted to go somewhere on Saturday, I'd get up early and go clean those stalls before. You know, uh, but my parents lived for their kids. I mean, uh, uh, that wasn't a punishment to clean horse stalls. It was just uh, my parents thought we needed to learn responsibility. Uh, my dad painted his pickup truck the color of my high school, my high school colors. You know, this is the kind of family I came from. Um, and uh, as far as I know, I'm, I'm the only alcoholic in my immediate family. I, my my father was would drink beer. He liked to drink some beer, but the the idea of drinking uh, till he couldn't stand up would just something he, he couldn't begin to understand, uh, or if it would affect his driving, you know, <laughs> like really, uh, uh, <laughs> why why would you do that? You know, he asked me one time. Uh, I. Uh, he, he said, "I don't understand this. I get the thing about drinking, but I, I don't. I don't understand what the what the attraction of cocaine is." And I said, "Well, you know, cocaine stimulates endorphins, you know, and it just it it has the same effect that laughing or making love has." He said, "Why don't you just laugh and make love?" And uh, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> uh, well, we do. We just do it quick. And uh, 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 <laughs> by the way, I, I, I've already mentioned drugs. I, I, I should get this out of the way. If there's anyone here who is offended by the mentioning of drugs in an Alcoholics Anonymous uh, meeting, uh, I want to apologize. Um, um, just because you're offended, not because I said it. I mean, I, I, uh, it's part of my story, and to leave it out would, would be not telling my story. I, uh, I like the, the way that Carla says it. I hope you didn't plan to say this tomorrow, honey, but uh, Carla says um, mentioning drugs in a, an AA meeting is not a violation of the fifth tradition, but not mentioning alcohol is. Um, I, uh, 
I used every drug that I ever heard of, um, except, of course, the ones I've heard of since I got sober, uh, which, you know, you wonder. I mean, uh, <laughs> see, that's, that's why you hang out with new people, you know? Like, uh, hey, kid, welcome to AA. Did you ever do any of that uh, ice? Yeah. How was that? <laughs> Dude, I'm here, you know. So, uh, <laughs> never met a drug that alcohol couldn't help. And, uh, <laughs> and but still, I I, I, I want to make this disclaimer. If I had known, if I could have seen around corners, you know, to see where my life was going to end up going. Uh, just out of respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, if I had known, the first time somebody said, hey, Matt, try this, I would have said, uh, you know, I'd love to, but I'm going to be speaking at an AA meeting in 30 years, and I, and I don't want to piss anybody off. So, um, so, so anyway, uh, but I, I just love me some whiskey. I, I quit all the illegal drugs two years before I got sober. I was going to CA because I had a bad cocaine problem and I wanted to stop it. And I, and I went and, and CA helped me. Um, and, but there was a guy there I was going to ask to be my sponsor. And he said a couple of dumb things. One thing I said to him, you know, I got to tell you, I'm an atheist. And he said, no, you're not. And I had to explain to him, I happen to be the leading authority on what Doug Rao believes. So, um, uh, and God isn't in the picture, you know, so, uh, I, I, I guess I understand today what he meant, you know, like they say, oh, jump up in the air and try to stay there or try to hold back the tide or something. I don't know. But anyway, that kind of irritated me. But then the, the clincher was um, he said to me uh, just out of nowhere, uh, listen, if you want some quality sobriety, you ought to give up that whiskey. <laughs> and I thought outside issue, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> cocaine was uh, illegal and expensive, and I was around people who were getting arrested and shot, and I knew that uh, I had to stop dealing, and if I stopped dealing, I was going to have to stop using, because I didn't have $300,000 to spend <laughs> on recreation, so, uh, so it was just a rational decision, I thought, to, you know, act like a grown-up for a minute, and... Uh, um, but so, I, you know, I, I and I had just brushed my teeth before I went to the meeting. So I don't know where he got that whiskey thing. But um, <laughs> but on the way home from that meeting, I remember thinking, you know, there's a part, an inside rational mind that tells you when it's time to quit. You know when it's time to quit. So I quit CA right away. And uh, uh, I just drank for two years. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I, uh, it was a rough two years. You know, I, <laughs> uh, well, actually, it's, it was getting rough before then, obviously. Uh, I, I, uh, and I want to I thank the committee for inviting us. Carla and I, when we, we get to invited individually and together to do this kind of thing a lot, and we love it. We both love it. Uh, and then when we get invited together, that's the best. You know, we just, we love each other, man. We just, it's like, we, we wake up in the morning, oh, you know, <laughs> she's still here. And, and, uh, <laughs> thank you, you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and we just, we just have a ball. Our lives center around Alcoholics Anonymous. Both of our lives do. They did before we got together, and now it's as a team, you know, and, and that's just, that's wonderful. You'll hear her talk tomorrow. Um, and, uh, she's the real deal. You know, I'm sort of the clown in this circus. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank Butch for your talk last night. I, I, I love, I love Butch for a long time. And, uh, you know, we, and we just, when Carla and I heard that Butch was going to be here, we were like, oh boy, oh boy, because <laughs> we knew we were going to have fun, you know, and, and Kathy, thank you, Kathy, for your talk. I know it was a lot better than you think it was. <laughs> she said she's out of practice. She said she's out of practice, you know, so that, that you kind of get like, I don't know, you know, I haven't got the, I haven't got my, uh, my chops up or something, but, uh, Kathy's like, 
I've, I've spoken at several uh, conferences with Kathy, and she's like a grown-up, man, you know, uh, and, I, uh, and I love that. You know, she's just like a real grown-up, because they're sparse around here, and, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and not because she's in Al-Anon. I know some Al-Anons that I just love with all my heart. They really don't qualify as grown-ups. They're, some of them are about a seven-ounce cores away from being in our room, and... Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, I just, you know, so I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. And Anthony and Tammy were, have been great hosts uh, for us. So I mean, we've had a lot of a lot of fun. We went went to see Crazy Horse this afternoon, and uh, I was here like ten years ago. And uh, Bergie loaned me a scooter. <laughs> loaned me a scooter. I said, "You want to go anywhere? Yeah, I like to go up in the Black Hills and see Rushmore." I said, "You want to borrow my Road King?" Yeah. So <laughs> that's like, you know, in some circles that would, hey, Bergie, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the loan of your bike, man. And uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, the people who, who aren't motorcycle people, I don't know, that's like saying you want to borrow my wife for the weekend. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a real, it's a real honor. And so I got to ride around through the Black Hills 10 years ago, and, and today got to go over and see Crazy Horse and look at that commitment. We talk about commitments in AA. Nobody who is working on that, there are people working on that who are dedicating their lives to it who weren't born when it was started, and they'll be dead before it's finished. And this is their life's work, you know, and I got to admire that kind of uh, uh, commitment. And, um, and, that, and we have some of that here. You know, I heard Ken Devaney say, when I'm all over the place tonight, but I, I'm all right with that. Uh, <laughs> I heard Ken Devaney say one time, uh, AA is like, he said, when I was in school and growing up in New York, we went to see the, our class went to see the uh, Statue of Liberty, and they have a spiral staircase going up, and the teacher had them hold hands. And if you're in the middle of it, you can't see the beginning of the, of the line, and you can't see the end of the line, but you know you're connected to the beginning and the end because you're holding hands with the people next to you who are connected to the beginning of the end. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is, you know, and, uh, um, gee, I, uh, I countdown here. This is a particularly interesting countdown. Uh, it's very rare that uh, you see the people with 30 to 34 years outnumber the people with one year. Uh, and, and that's just the way it is here. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that, that they're more, any more important. I have 27 years and nine months of, of sobriety. And uh, my my darling wife has uh, only twenty seven years and six months, and and, and uh, <laughs> so so whenever we get in a real lock, in a horns lock, I just say, honey, just you you may be right, you know, uh, uh, just wait three months, and you know you'll get it. Uh, uh, but I want to welcome all the new people. But I got to tell you, there's a I, my home group is a 7 a.m. meeting. We meet every day of the year in, in North Hollywood uh, at 7 a.m. And uh, it's a good, it's a great meeting. And as we've always got newcomers, and we've always got people with over 40 years. And uh, and we got the balance somewhere in the middle. And and uh, a guy, this guy, very charismatic young man who is new in AA, and he came in to save his life. And uh, uh, but he's opinionated, you know, and. Uh, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, he raised his hand to share, and he said, you know, I got to say, I hear people around here say the newcomer is the most important person in the room. And yet, I can't tell you how many times since I've been here that somebody will shush me. If, I'm the mo if, if the newcomer is the most important person in the world, don't scare them out of the rooms by shushing them. So everybody, of course, in, in California, we clap at everything. We don't care what you say, really. Uh, I said, Gee. I raised my hand. I said, uh, some people call this crosstalk, Daniel. I just uh, call it, <laughs> I just call it um, long timer advice. Uh, but I've been shushed in AA, and I may be shushed again. There's a good chance for that. Every single time it was because I was talking when I shouldn't have been talking, usually when someone else is talking. This isn't AA stuff. This is kindergarten shit. You know, and uh, uh, so, so, 
So this is something, if you didn't learn at home, you can learn it in AA. And, it, and when we say the newcomer is the most important person in the room, that's true. If it weren't for newcomers, AA would die on the vine. We got to have fresh blood coming in. People come in, do these steps, get this thing, pass it on to the next one. But we don't need all of you. You know, uh, <laughs> newcomers are a dime a dozen, man. I hope you stick, you know. Uh, so. <laughs> he told me later, I was going to ask you to be my sponsor if you weren't so old, you know. But uh, anyway, so I don't know where I was when I, when I, <laughs> I was in the middle of an AA talk. Hello, here's where I am. <laughs> I uh, I started with my first drink. Uh, I was 18 years old, so I didn't start too young. You know, I know I was going to tell you that my dad would have occasional beer, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know he he would just like be working on a car on Saturday afternoon, or working in the yard, or uh, watching a football game, and stop and have a beer, and then go back to what he was doing, which I always found it kind of fascinating. If if I Whatever I'm doing, if I stop and have a beer, now that's what I'm doing. And whatever I was doing before couldn't have been that important, or why would I stop and have a beer? So uh, so my mother, uh, my mother may be an alcoholic, actually. We don't know. We can't tell, because she won't drink. And... Uh, <laughs> how are you going to tell? I mean, you know, when I... When I first got sober, I'm looking around for why I'm an alcoholic, because it seemed like an important thing to know. It's an absolutely useless piece of information. Why am I an alcoholic? But it seemed like it was something that would be important to know. I don't know. Maybe I could stop it if I knew. You know, that's not. Uh, if there's anybody here, by the way, that came tonight to find out if you're an alcoholic, I have bad news. Um, <laughs> that's not something non-alcoholics ever do. So, um, <laughs> so welcome. Uh, <laughs> you're the newcomer. We need you. Uh, and uh, <laughs> my mom, when I got sober, I'm, I'm looking for how come I'm an alcoholic. And I, and I realized my mom, I said, uh, I know that her mother was an alcoholic. So I said, why don't you drink? She said, what do you care? I said, well, are, are you an alcoholic? She said, Doug, have you ever seen me take a drink? I said, no, I haven't, but I know hundreds of alcoholics that don't drink. Why don't you drink? Are you an alcoholic? She said, how could I be an alcoholic? I, I, I said, well, there's, you know, there's such a thing as a genetic predisposition. You know, it may be your fault I'm a drunk, Mom. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and she had pretty much the same reaction you did to that. And, and uh, she said, really? Oh, my, well, excuse me, she said. <laughs> no, she said, when I was young, uh, I drank some, and every time I drank, I got sick, stupid, and obnoxious, so I just stopped. And I said, you you got to drink through that, Mom. You know, the um, <laughs> promised land lays beyond sick, stupid, and obnoxious. Uh, <laughs> but I... Uh, I, I uh, started drinking when I was 18 because my friend Morris, who was sort of my sexual sponsor, he said, if you want to get a home run with this girl, you're going to have to get her drunk. And and Because uh, we used to use these baseball things. I don't know. Probably people my age might remember that we used to have, like, we had a first base, second base, third base, home run. I don't remember the bases. Uh, doesn't matter. You know, I'm married. Uh, and... Uh, uh, <laughs> no, because there's not enough bases. You know what I'm saying? I don't mean like step up to the plate and slide home, but uh, but but there ought to be more bases, and and it doesn't really matter, you know. And so, but um, but at the time we knew what you know. Hey, Tommy got the second base. Oh, hey, all right, Tommy. You know, but I, I remember home run. I knew what, everybody remembers what home run was. So Morris said, if you want to get a home run, you're going to have to get her drunk. I heard that. And I didn't care about drinking. I, my, I had friends in high school. They drank. They got sick, stupid, and obnoxious. I didn't. It wasn't attractive to me. But now more. Now I have a, d a different uh, agenda, you know. So I went and stole a quart of Rainier Ale, which is sort of like the national beverage of Garden Grove, California, where I grew up. And, and uh, 
we went out and parked where we had parked a number of times before, but this time I got my ammunition, you know, and I, I still didn't care about drinking. I wasn't interested. I would have been happy to say, here, drink this and let me know when you're ready. Uh, but uh, it's just, it's, it seemed rude, you know, uh, so I, you know, I just opened it and had a pool and passed it to her. I, guess, I think she was there for the same thing I was there for, but, you know, we passed this bottle back and forth till we finished it, and and uh, I got a little buzz. I got a little, you know, feeling lightheaded and, and happy, and so did she. And, you know, I'm not going to stand in a room full of alcoholics, 400 alcoholics, and say, hey, listen, uh, half a quarter of Rainier Ale will take you downtown, but uh, if you're 18 years old and you've never had any alcohol, it does the trick, you know, it gets your attention. I was like, hey, yeah, you know, so did she, and we started making out, and, and then one thing led to another, and it turned out Morris was right. This was the first time I ever got an alcohol buzz and the first time I ever had sex in front of a witness. So uh, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to do both of these things much as I can the rest of my life. And... It wasn't crazy horse, but it was a commitment, you know, and uh, uh, and so uh, so I mean, you know, I I got in the music business and uh, and I and I all and and it, that I, that was in the late '60s, and and one you know it was just like a time you know when it was like uh, Woodstock and uh, and uh, Haight Ashbury, and I started traveling around and playing and. Stayed in the music business performing for a while, and there was always drugs and alcohol around. And later on, I got a job in TV as a um, as a technician, as a, a prop man, and uh, retired from that when I was 25. But but um, I'm no when I, no 20 after I worked for him for 25 years, and uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, early retirement. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, along the way, alcohol and drugs just became more and more part of my life. They, they took over my life. Uh, you know, the old saying, if you haven't heard it, you, you, this, you'll hear it again in Alcoholics Anonymous. The man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And uh, uh, Bill Wilson said, uh, alcohol gave me wings to fly, and then he took away the sky. And that's what happened. And alcohol I, was uh, damaging me. Uh, I had a friend, Teddy, who got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. She was a bad drunk. She was a good drunk. She was a fun drunk, you know. She really was fun. It was great to go places with her, but you, all, you had about a 70 80% chance of getting in trouble, uh, which was attractive, but, <laughs> but you, you know, uh, but when she got sober, I was glad that she did. I would miss her as drinking and using friend, but uh, but she was going to hurt somebody. And, and uh, so, but within a short time, I saw the change in her. She would be where she said she was going to be when she said she was going to be there. She'd show up, dressed appropriately, speaking in whole sentences. And uh, I noticed the difference, you know. And uh, But Teddy, every time you talked to her, she would seem like every other paragraph would have something like Big Book or Steps or My Sponsor Says. Or, you know, I was at a meeting, but finally I said, look, Teddy, I don't know if you're trying to draft me, um, but I'll tell you something. If I ever see alcohol interfering with my life, I probably will go to AA. Okay, let me give you a sort of a snapshot of the Doug that Teddy knew. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had gotten drunk up at Mammoth skiing, and I skied off a cliff drunk. Uh, I we, I like to ski. I like to get there in the morning when the lifts first open and get on the lift, and as soon as uh, I'm up uh, off the snow, take my gloves off and hook them on my vest and reach over here and get my little vial of cocaine and do a little wake up one and one and then I reach over in this pocket and get my flask out and have a little shot of whiskey 8.30 in the morning and then I get my windless pipe out and I just enjoy the scenery all the way up to the top of the hill and then get off, check my bindings, have a shot out of my Boda bag, a little white wine loosen up because I'm a soul skier, you know and uh, I... Uh, I believe it's much more important to feel it than to see it, and uh, uh, the problem with this is that uh, after about 20 or 30 runs, you're doing this, and it's about 3.30, 4.30 in the afternoon, and the shadows are getting long, and the snow's icing over, and uh, 
it, it's harder to ski and you have less control. And I, I skied right off a cliff. Uh, don't get the impression that it was an accident. I thought I could make it. Uh, <laughs> it was shortly after the Winter Olympics, and uh, and I had seen these guys like Eddie Eagle go off, you know, 170 meters sailing through the air, and they, they lean way over the front of their skis. It's so pretty. Uh, and I thought they leaned over the front of their skis for looks. Now I found it's a, it's, there's a practical application for that. If you don't do that, your skis will go straight up in the air. And then you're coming down towards the planet with the skis on top, head on the bottom. <laughs> You'll never read uh, an article on unweighting in Ski Magazine on how to come down upside down. Uh, but that's what I did. I landed. And um, my, I, fortunately, my shoulder took the brunt of the of the hit, and I broke my shoulder. And the ski patrol had to take me down. And my sister was there. I had to drive my van down the back down to L.A. and put me in the hospital. And they operated on my shoulder. And I was out of work for six weeks. And I just got back. I was back to work about a month. Uh, and when uh, <laughs> somebody had a party that lasted all night long, and uh, I was, you know, one of the last people to leave. And and in the morning. Uh, the woman who owned the house said, if somebody would take me to the store, get some eggs, I'll uh, I'll make breakfast. I said, yeah, I'll do it. My my scooter was parked across the, the driveway. So, yeah, I'll do it. so we went out and we got on my Harley and uh, and started. I don't know why I thought Harleys and eggs was a good combination, but uh, <laughs> but we uh, we started to go to the store. And it was uh, Saturday morning in April. April in Southern California. It's not hot and it's not cold. It's brisk. At sunrise, the sun is just just shining across the horizon, you know, and it was so there wasn't much traffic and uh, and and it was beautiful and it was before the California helmet loss, so our hair is flying in the air and there's this brisk breeze hitting us, and the sun is just waking up and it's just so sexy we, and the rumble of the Harley, you know that we we both had the same idea. you know what would be beautiful is to make love in the great outdoors and uh I don't know if you're familiar with downtown Burbank, but it's uh, <laughs> not a lot of great lovemaking outdoor venues are uh, there. And uh, but we found this four-story parking structure, and uh, we were going to ride up to the top of the parking structure and have the whole thing to ourselves. But the gate was locked, so we rode around to the fire escape and um, started went up the fire escape, and the door was locked. So I said, well, you know what? It's got to be open from the inside. It's a fire escape. So I jumped off on the wall, and I'm going to swing over the wall and open it from the inside. But I'm hanging from the wall, and it's thicker than I thought. Instead of being like this, it's kind of like this. And I'm, and I'm kind of drunk, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm swinging back. I know I'm going to get over this wall, but I don't know what brilliant idea I'm going to come up with. And then I saw the wall going up, and... Uh, <laughs> This is a stationary wall. I must be falling. And uh, <laughs> so uh, my father was an engineer, uh, he, uh, a mathematician. He figured out that a uh, 185-pound man falling 54 feet takes 1.3 seconds. It's not very long, uh, but it's long enough to go, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's going to hurt. And uh, I landed feet first, and my knees buckled, and um, I hit this piece of hard dirt. My knees buckled, and my foot, my foot came. I kicked myself in the ass and um, <laughs> broke my pelvis in two places, snapped the heel bone off my right foot, and shoved it through my foot like a bowling ball and broke all the little bones in my foot. So my friend, who was up at the top of the fire escape, now runs running down to the bottom of the fire escape. And... Uh, she thought I was dead at first, but I was moaning. So, uh, here, but here's the thing. God has always been with me, whether I recognize it or not. This was the parking structure of St. Joseph's Hospital. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, she ran across to, into the hospital and said, Hey, uh, uh, my friend just fell off your parking lot and it broke him. Uh, he's, uh, <laughs> He's easy to find. Go over to the fire escape. The one crumpled up by the bottom is that's him. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. So they uh, put me in an ambulance and brought me across the lawn and uh, put me in, in the trauma center and then in the ER. And uh, 
They ended up keeping me there for 10 days in the hospital because they didn't know really what to do with my foot. My foot was so damaged that it looked like a ball. And it was uh, so many colors, more colors than you've ever seen on a piece of skin. It was yellow and green and blue and black and orange. <laughs> and, and it's like, you look at that at the bottom of your own leg and go, this is this is wrong, man. <laughs> it's just, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to walk on that thing again. And and the doctors would come in, they'd look at my foot, and they put X-rays up on the on the uh, windows and look at the windows. And uh, one young doctor came over. He said, "How did you do this?" I said, "I I, I fell off that parking structure right out there." And I said, "Oh yeah, usually they die." And. Uh, <laughs> So I had uh, I had friends bringing me in gifts, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> and it never occurred to me to say to my, the doctors, "Look, I know you're giving me Demerol and Percodan for the pain. I'm self-administering uh, cocaine and Irish whiskey. Is that uh, going to be a conflict, you know?" Because I I don't know if I ever thought about it, but if I had, I would have gone, "Hey, you know, I'm not out in the street. I'm in the hospital. It's not hard to find me. I'm right here, you know." But uh, uh, so. Uh, Anyway, I got out of there, and it took me five months to learn to walk without some kind of a stick, crutch, or a, a cane or something. And and uh, it turned out that I had a .40 blood alcohol level when I got out of there. Teddy was always a part a part of that. She was right in the middle of that. And and uh, uh, I had my daughter. My daughter's mother had left me when my daughter was two years old. She just said, I love you, Doug, but you, I, can't, I can't do this anymore, you know. But I, but I stayed in my daughter's life, and her mother remarried. And uh, and I, I stayed, I would pick her up from school a lot of times and keep her, um, you know, for until her mom got home from work and then take her home. And um, and so, and I would, you know, have keep her on the weekends sometimes. And so I stayed in her life. Uh, but one time I was supposed to pick her up at noon on a Saturday, uh, we were going to go see a movie. We were going to go to dinner, uh, come home to my house, spend the night. Next day, I'd take her home on Sunday. And uh, we were both looking forward to that. And uh, Saturday morning, before I could get over to her house at noon, I was already drunk. You know, I got up and had a beer for breakfast like people do. And, and uh, uh, you know, then I had another one. And, uh, well, I'm going to be with Star today. I can't do much drinking, so I better get it done right now, I guess. I don't know what I thought. But for some reason, I got over to her house, which is about 13, 14 miles away. And I was already too drunk, and I knew it. And I, damn it. Uh, I tried to act like I was just in a goofy mood, and nobody bought that. By the way, if you're new here tonight, if somebody says to you, have you been drinking? They already know the answer. Uh, so... <laughs> Just a little heads up on that. Um, but her, uh, my daughter's stepfather walked me out on the front porch, and he said, Doug, you're drunk. I said, I am. And he said, well, I can't let Star get in the car with you. She's like 12 years old. I said, I, I understand. And he said, damn it, you know, I want you to understand this. You're welcome in our home anytime, sober. Don't come over here drunk anymore. It's very hard on Star. Boy, and I understood, drunk as I was, I understood every syllable of what he said. You're welcome in our home anytime, sober. Don't come over here drunk anymore. It's very hard on Star. He didn't say, don't come over here drunk. We think you're going to embarrass us in front of the neighbors or break the furniture or fall in the pool. He was protecting my only child from me. And that's what he should do. And I understood every bit of that. And it broke my heart. I just, I, there was nothing I could do about it. And I, I said, I, I, oh, okay, I get it. I got in my car and I was just, I was demolished. Because I wanted to be a good parent. I told you I had good parents. I know what good parenting looks like. I wanted that more than anything. Starshine was my only child. And she, she can't help it. Her parents were hippies, starshine. But uh, uh, <laughs> she, uh, she was the most important person in the world to me, and I, and, and I couldn't be a good parent to her. I couldn't stay sober till noon. And I started to drive away, and I just started to cry. I couldn't hold the tears back. And once they started, man, it was like Niagara Falls. They were just coming. I was crying so hard I couldn't see to drive. I turned on the windshield wipers, <laughs> which <laughs> turned out that was no help at all. And, and uh, 
And I pulled into a parking lot, and I, I, I opened the door of my car, and I put my feet on the pavement and my head in my hands, and I just sobbed like a baby. I just sobbed uncontrollably. And I looked up, and I saw this red neon sign that said liquor. And I, uh, I got out of the car, and I walked into the liquor store, and I bought a pint of whiskey. And I came back to the car, and I opened that bottle, and I uh, had a pull of that bottle. And then I had another one, and I was better. I was okay. This is something that non-alcoholics will never understand. They can't. And that's, that's why they, they judge us a lot of times unfairly, because they don't understand. If you could be in the kind of inconsolable pain that I was in over the way I was treating my daughter and have two swallows of a liquid and feel better, why would you ever give that up? How could you ever give that up? That's what they don't understand. If, if you tell this story in a PTA meeting, you know, they, uh, <laughs> you know they, they look at you like you're an unfit parent, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I understood. It sounded like you said you were so distraught over your drinking that you drank. Uh, and, yeah, that's right, and then I could drive. I hope you weren't on Tampa Avenue that uh, <laughs> day, because I truly am a danger to myself and others. Uh, uh, but, um, but Teddy knew about that, too. So the reason I'm telling you all this stuff right now is because <laughs> we're suspended from this moment in my living room when I said to Teddy, if I see alcohol interfering with my life, <laughs> I probably will go to AA. And she, <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, what would you call interference, Doug? Brain death? <laughs> I said, okay, I see where you're going with this, but um, <laughs> I don't think accidents should count. You know, uh, uh, anybody fall off a four-story building drunk or sober, you're going to get hurt. So I, I, you know don't go there. And so she just said, okay, whatever. She just gave, you know, she just quit. She just like, okay, I'm out of here. And, uh, but all that week, every time I'd have a little quiet moment, I'd picture Teddy's face saying, what would you call interference? Brain death? And I started to focus on brain death. And I thought any one of those accidents, ones I told you about just now, other ones that I didn't tell you about could have ended up in brain death. And the next one very well may. And there'll be a next one. There always has been. And it scared me. Due to my drinking, I could end up in a wheelchair or in bed for the rest of my life, not able to feed myself or go to the bathroom by myself and know it. That's on the table if I keep drinking. It scared me. It scared the hell out of me. So I rushed right down to AA three years later. And uh, <laughs> I like to think about stuff, you know. Uh, but I went to my first AA meeting. I didn't go to get sober. I went to see what was going on in AA, just to see what it was. I really didn't know much about it, uh, except I knew people who were sober, and, and, and I liked what was going on with them. So I went to my first AA meeting. I went to a big speaker meeting. Somebody told me, go to a big speaker meeting. They'll leave you alone. It's not true. It's a lie. Um, but uh, I guess they meant, you know, you won't have to talk or something, you know. But uh, Anyway, well, I didn't know what time the meeting started. It ended up it started at 8.30, but I got there like 6.30 because I didn't know what time it started. And I didn't, you know, if I had to fill out papers or sign, you know, a release or something, you know, whatever, um, uh, prove I was an alcoholic. I don't know what I had to do. But I got there about 6.30, and people were starting to set up chairs. It was a big speaker meeting, about 200 people in a um, subterranean community room at a, at a hospital in Van Nuys, California, and... Uh, and so I just stood against the wall by the double doors and looked irritated. As I, I've learned that people will leave you alone if you do that. Well, not in AA so much. You know, people were coming up to me and saying, hey, you're new, right? No, I'm not. Most people would go away. Oh, okay, sorry. Because uh, I guess they're embarrassed because they didn't remember my name or something. But so that's, work, that's working. Excuse me, this one guy, I mean, he goes, you're new. I said, no, I'm not. Oh, I haven't seen you here before. What's your name? So my name's Doug, and I haven't been here before. That's why you haven't seen me here before. So uh, take a hike. And uh, he said, oh, oh, well, that's what we mean by new. You haven't been here before. I said, okay, all right, I get it. Well, I am new. I'm new like I haven't been here before, but I'm not new like a new member. 
okay? I'm not a new joiner-upper alcoholic, okay? I'm not somebody who came here to see if you could help me. I don't have any confidence that you can help me. I'm just over here. My, I'm, I'm, I'm auditing the class, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a visitor. I'm observing, all right? You know, I'm not a joiner, pal. I, I've never been a joiner in my life. I never fit any place in my life. I'm an outlaw. I'm a desperado, okay? A misfit. I, I didn't fit in school. Uh, I, I don't fit in the workplace. I barely fit in my own damn family, you know? So I'm certainly not going to fit here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Hug, hug, laugh, laugh. Isn't it good we're not drinking? No, I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I like drinking. I drank on the way here, you know. <laughs> I fully intend to drink on the way home. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm your target market. Uh, and, uh, and he goes, uh, I, I said, you know, I'm just, I'm over here minding my own business, okay? You might try that sometime, see how that works for you. And uh, Don't put me on your little list. Don't, me, uh, don't give me your number. Don't ask for mine. Let's just, you know. Be separate but equal, okay? How's that work for you? And, and he goes, I like you. <laughs> You're going to fit right in. I'm like, I couldn't have been more articulate, you know, but, uh, okay. So they started the meeting, and, and uh, there was another guy there who uh, um, was also leaning in against the wall by the double doors. He didn't help him set up chairs or make coffee either. We were sitting there. We didn't even talk to each other. We were, I thought, we're the cool section here. <laughs> Everybody else is working. We're just sitting here watching them, you know, judging them. And uh, we were so cool, we didn't even talk to each other. We're like, hey, dude. And um, so they started the meeting, and I remember some things. They read some stuff, like Dennis read tonight, you know, Chapter 5. I didn't know it was Chapter 5. Actually, I was looking for the steps because I'd heard about the steps. And I get they had them on the wall, uh, but... Um, then and uh, when they read chapter five, the steps are in there. But I missed that. You know what I heard out of chapter five? People who want to get sober have to be honest. If you're not honest, you can't stay sober. Even crazy people can get on sober if they're honest, if they have the capacity to be honest. Not just any kind of honest, rigorous honest. You got to be honest, rigorously honest. That's what I heard from chapter five. Honest, 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 honest. Because I. Honesty is not my go-to method, you know, mechanism. <laughs> it's uh, like, I love what Bush said last night. I would lie when the truth would serve me better. Uh, and, um, I, you know, the most, before I got sober, the most honest thing I ever said was when my, my daughter's wife, uh, uh, mother said to me, uh, all right, Doug, I want the truth. Did you sleep with my sister? And I said, no, not a wink. And uh, um, uh, if you're new and you hear this rigorous honesty thing, that doesn't mean when you go, <laughs> do it with a grain of salt. Like when, that doesn't mean when you go home, if your wife says, honey, does this dress make me look fat? Rigorous honesty. No, baby, I think it's the haagen you know. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, the dress looked fine on the hanger, but... Uh, <laughs> Let's go try it on the skinny blonde next door. If it makes her look fat, then it, it's the dress. I bet you put down that spoon for a couple of weeks. It'll look great, you know. So you don't got, that's rigorous stupidity. You don't got to do that. Um, so, uh, so anyway, they went on with the meeting. They, and in California, I don't know if you do this here. California, we call ce uh, celebrations of years of sobriety. Sometimes they call them anniversaries. California, Southern California, we call them birthdays. Everything is like Disneyland there, you know. Birthdays, we have cakes and candles, and we sing, happy birthday. I didn't, didn't know any of that. So I'm I'm, um, stand, I'm standing up at the back. Somebody said there's some chairs up there. No, no, I want to stand up uh, for the whole. I may have to leave in the middle of it. I don't want to cause a big scene or anything. So I'll just stand at the back. Me and the other cool guy are both standing in the back. So uh, uh, the secretary said, we have a birthday tonight for Ruth for 18 years. And everybody's like, yay. And, and uh, so she said, uh, uh, come on up. And so I'm looking around for Ruth, some 18-year-old tiny hiney, you know. And uh, the only woman standing up and walking towards the stage is this woman. She's 50 if she's a day. And nobody else is standing up. And I thought, damn, if that's Ruth, she should stop drinking. She, uh, <laughs> you know. 
She didn't look bad. I mean, she was, she was, she was dressed up and made up and quaffed, you know. This is her big birthday date, and, and, uh, and I, I saw her. She didn't look like she just crawled out of the gutter, and I thought, okay, I get it. I'm a figure outer. This is AA. They don't drink here. Ruth hasn't had a drink in 18 years. I get it. Happy birthday, Ruth. Oh my God, I cued the choir. I didn't know, I didn't know that you sang, you know. <laughs> and I, I told you, I'm a musician, you know. I, uh, 200 people started singing happy birthday in four different keys at the same time. <laughs> and nobody seemed to notice but me. Not even the other cool guy who was singing along with them. And I thought, th you know, doesn't anybody, I mean, <laughs> and many of them were not even committed to the key they started in. <laughs> and I thought, somebody in this room can play a, a happy birthday on the piano. There's a piano on stage with a sheet over it. I thought, somebody in this room can play happy birthday. It's not a hard song. It's three chords. I'm a guitar player, but I can fake it on the piano. Maybe I should. I thought, maybe I'll just run up there. Hold it, folks. Here I come to save the day, you know, and just get everybody in the same key. And then I thought, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. A lot of times that hero thing doesn't work out like I think it's going to. And uh, why don't I just shut up and let them sing? And so they did, uh, sang, and they finished, keep coming back. And Ruth gets up. She says, my name, she blows out candles. My name's Ruth, and I'm an alcoholic. And, of course, everybody goes, hi, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, this is kindergarten. <laughs> Jeff mentioned Scott R. earlier. Uh, Scott R. is <laughs> a good friend of mine. He said when he went to his first meeting and they started doing that high stuff, he goes, oh, my God, this is some level of lameness I never knew was available to me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, Ruth steps up and she says, I want you to know that over these last 18 years of sobriety, I've attended a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every single day. And it seemed like everybody was real impressed with that. Except me, I'm in the back going, you're a little slow, aren't you, Ruth? You, you, <laughs> you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer, sweetie. <laughs> now, I don't know if I want this thing, but I know this. If I decide I want it, not going to take every day for 18 years. I didn't even know you could go to a meeting every day, let alone for 18 years. So I look over at the other cool guy, and all of a sudden my, my world is shattered. He's not cool. He's a member. I don't know why he's standing at the back. Maybe he's got the newcomer catcher commitment or something, but he's, but now he's heading over to me, and I know he's a member because he got his hand out like we do, you know, and that sunbeam for Jesus smile. <laughs> He takes my hand in both hands and he says, hey, I'll tell you what, you stay sober a year, we'll give you one of them cakes. <laughs> I don't know anything about this guy, uh, except that he values cake more than I do. And, and uh, cause to, I don't know, to me, a cake, really, if I don't drink for... seems to me if you don't drink for a year... You ought to get a car, you know, a cake, really. So, um, but I don't want to, I, I just, I was so shocked I couldn't make fun of him. I, I said, uh, you know, I, I'm not a big pastry eater. Um, <laughs> if I wanted a cake, I'd just, you know, go stop at Safeway on the way home. I think they're like five bucks, you know, <laughs> or I could not drink for a year. Hmm. <laughs> And I love this this part of the of the meeting. Somebody spoke at that meeting. There was a speaker meeting, like this is. Somebody did what I did, am doing now. Monopolized most of the meeting talking about themselves. I cannot tell you if the speaker was a man or a woman. I I I don't know why. I don't know if it was a good speaker or a bad speaker. I don't know if it was a man or a woman or what he or she said. My friend Casey, um, late Casey C, told me one time, you know, I was the speaker at that meeting, that first meeting you went to. I said, how do you know that? He said, what do you, you don't know. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, but uh, after the after the speaker, the secretary said, blah, 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 blah. This is our big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the basic text of our program. The only authority on AA. If you're new tonight, please don't leave without this book. So I thought, well, I am new. 
I'll steal that book. <laughs> they had a lot of them. They had several of them on a, on a table with some other literature, and I thought I could go pick up that book, act like I'm fascinated, walk right out the door, and I had a feeling they'd say, let him go, if they even notice. And I, I was sure that I believe today that might have happened. But she screwed it up. The secretary said, if you're new tonight and you're financially embarrassed, we understand that. We've been there. We want you to have the book. Believe me, we'll make liberal credit arrangements, including nothing down and nothing a week till you get back on your feet. Which sounds loving and generous, unless you're going to steal the book. And uh, <laughs> now if I steal the book, you'll think I'm homeless, you know. So, I mean, I got to buy the book. I got to wait till the end of the meeting, and I got to buy the book. And uh, I don't know how much it costs. She said, we sell it at our cost. Yeah, okay, whatever. You know, it's probably 20, 30 bucks. It's a hardcover book. Um, I don't care how much it is, but it's 40 bucks. If I got to write a bad check for it, I'm buying this book tonight. <laughs> so uh, so now I got to, after the meeting, and I uh, went up and, and said to the secretary, excuse me, can I, uh, can I buy one of your books? She says, oh, the big book? Yeah, yeah, the big book. <laughs> I've seen bigger. Uh, <laughs> How much is that big book? She said it's uh, it's four sixty five. Do you have it? Four dollars and sixty five cents for a hardcover book. Yeah, I think I can handle that. Here's a uh, here's a five. Keep the change. <laughs> she said, No, we don't do that. Well, I'll get your change. No, no, please. Uh, I'm serious. I want you to keep the change, lady, and use that change to help a drunk because I'm on my feet. Okay. So I uh, got my book, and on the way home, I stopped at a liquor store, and I got a pint of whiskey. No, I didn't. I got a fifth of whiskey. And I uh, I got home, and I sat down with this book, and I poured about three fingers of whiskey, and I started to read this book. I didn't stay up all night studying the big book. I, I just, uh, I'm a I'm a quick study. I'm a hum a few bars and I'll fake it kind of guy, you know. Uh, I And I have the ability to look at the title of a chapter in any book and pretty much know everything in the chapter. It's a, the gift that I have, you know, and so, uh, so I'm, uh, I bought doctor's opinion. I didn't bother with. I've had doctor's opinions, and uh, so I got to chapter one, Bill's story. Who cares? Chapter two. There's a solution. Is a sales pitch. There's a solution, young man. There's a solution to your problem. The twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will give you a life beyond your wildest drunken dreams. Great. Chapter three. More about alcoholism. That sounds like it could be the most boring piece of literature in the English language. So I'm going to save that one until I'm tweaking some night and feel like I got toothpicks in my eyelids. You know? More about... So I'm already up to chapter four, and I haven't, I've hardly read a word. But chapter four got my attention, because it's called We Agnostics. Now... When I went to my first meeting, I expected to find a room full of alcoholics who drank like I did and don't drink anymore and were atheists and agnostics. Because my grandmother, who I mentioned was a drunk, my mother's mother, got sober when she found Jesus. She found Jesus. She picked up the cross. She dedicated her life to Christ. She became an ordained minister. She opened a Skid Row mission on Beacon Street in San Pedro, California. And she spent the last 37 years of her life doing pretty much what we do. Trust God, clean house, help others. That's what she did. And she never had another drink the last 37 years of her life. But she hated AA. And I thought she hated AA because there was no God here. And I understand today, I wish I'd had a chance to talk about it with her more, but uh, but I understand today that it is a different concept of God, that she was not happy with, you know, it wasn't, it's not, uh, you know, a God, a Christ, I am the way and the truth and the life, so she didn't want anything to do with it. But But when I walked into AA and I heard everybody talking about my higher power, power greater than yourself, humbly asked him with a capital H, admitted to God, prayed to God, oh my God, God, the last house on the block is Sunday school. <sighs> I'm just, I'm so disappointed. But now I got this big book the secretary had said was the only authority. Got a whole chapter called We Agnostics. So I poured about another three fingers of whiskey and I read chapter four all the way through. And I got done, I thought, I have absolutely no idea what I just read. So, Because I'm looking for how the smart people stay sober without God and it's not in there. It's a trick title. It should be called 
how we agnostics came to believe in a power greater than ourselves, which saved us from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. But it won't fit at the top of the page, so they <laughs> put that trick title up there. But I, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to figure out how the smart people do it without God, because I don't think I can do this God thing. So I, I, um, I poured some more whiskey, and I read it again. And I believe that I did. That I poured some more whiskey and read it a third time. I'm not sure, because I was a little drunk that night. And uh, but uh, eventually, some of what's actually on that in that chapter jumped off the page at me. There's a sentence, very subtle, and extremely significant that says, "We found that God doesn't make too hard terms on those who seek Him." That's what it says. And when I realized what that said. I thought I've never heard that before. I considered myself somewhat knowledgeable about the religions of the world, Western and Eastern. Not an, an expert in any kind of a, a, a class of, of experts, but, but a little bit knowledgeable. But I had never heard anybody of any organized religion say, we don't think God makes hard terms. If anything, my grandmother's Pentecostal church said exactly the opposite. They'd say, you know, Ugh, they call me. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't quite say my one syllable name in a whole syllable, you know. Uh, Hello, Doug. I hope you brought your guitar. We're going to make a joyful noise tonight. And uh, they would say, You know, Doug, we are very sure that God makes hard times on those who seek Him. Boy, you know, God will not even hear your prayers unless you're baptized. And I don't mean sprinkle on the forehead like some Methodist. No, no, I'm talking about total submission, boy. That's why we got a tank of water for Christ up here. Come on up, son. We're going to soak you down, pull you up, worse than the blood of the lamb. Praise Jesus. Amen. Somebody get that boy a towel. And, I, you know, I'm 14 years old, and I, I'm sure my grandmother wouldn't let him drown her only grandson, but uh, maybe she told him I touched myself, you know, and I... <laughs> For all I know, they could gang up and send my ass to Jesus for my own good. And, and uh, <laughs> to hear Brother Van Dyke the next day saying, Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to miss that boy's guitar playing, but thank God he don't have to abuse himself no more. And uh, <laughs> So, I, you know, I, I, I told him, yeah, I, I know I'm not getting wet in this room tonight. I know that. I, I said, uh, you know what, I have brand new Levi's on. They're shrink to fit. And so, uh, like, if I get in, I wouldn't be able to ride my bicycle home. Give this suck up, you know. I'll, I'll come back some other time. And so I'm out of there. I'm not coming back. But it wasn't just the Pentecostals. My girlfriend was a Catholic. She had to go confession, communion, confirmation, a bunch of other cons to uh, determine how many Hail Marys and Our Fathers would cleanse her soul of the various kinds of sins. And, and um uh, uh, my friend Michael was a, an Orthodox Jew, which he and his brother Sherm had to wear spit curls to school. Which I, oh, there's a loving God for you, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> went over to Michael's house for dinner one night, and his, his his mother says, "Doug, welcome to our home. Would you like to join us in some wine and hala? <laughs> some what?" She said, <clears throat> "Would you like to join our family in some?" wine and holla. I said, well, uh, I'll have some wine. I, uh, I'm not much of a pastry eater, uh, Mrs. Stein. And, uh, you know, and then there were Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. Oh, my. So uh, by the time I got to AA, I'm like, here's the line, all the religions of the world over there, and I'll be over here making fun of you. That's the guy that came to AA. But here was this chapter saying, we found that God doesn't make too hard terms on those who seek him. And it was preceded by a sentence that said, you don't have to accept anyone's concept of God. Pretty clear stuff. Uh, and, it, and it got my attention. So I went back to, uh, back to AA, and I started going regularly. Started going five, six, seven times a week, different groups. In L.A., there, at that time, there was 2,000 meetings. Now there's more like 3,000. But... Uh, I could go to meetings, different meetings every night and uh, and in the daytime sometime and go to different, because I didn't want anybody to get to know me. That's really why. I wasn't trying to get an overview of AA, but I ended up getting an overview of AA. And um, so I didn't have a home group. I certainly didn't have a sponsor. Uh, I didn't read the book. I didn't take the steps. I didn't know what a tradition was. 
I didn't have a commitment anywhere, certainly. I didn't believe in God, and I was drinking every day. Except for that, I had a pretty good program. But uh, my, uh, <laughs> my program consisted of keep coming back. And I went to meetings, and some meetings I liked a lot. I remember going to the San Fernando group and walking up the stairs at that group, and it seemed like it was all cowboys and scooter trash and housewives. And I thought, I like this. This is I, I've always gotten very along very well with cowboy scooter trash and housewives. And uh so I started going to the San Fernando group and a couple of other groups around and, and but but I was still drinking and I I would try not to drink on the way to a meeting, certainly never drank in a meeting. Uh and a lot of times I would drink on the way home. If I was going to a meeting two meetings in a row, I <clears throat> maybe I'd have a half pint. I thought if I ate some onion rings and a taco would guard, guard my breath. I was just crazy. But um what finally happened was I came home from uh, from a meeting uh, one night, and uh, usually I would come home, it would be like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and uh, I'd have a bottle of whiskey, and I'd lay on the floor and turn on the TV and drink whiskey until I passed out. And uh, this one night, I, I, uh, I woke up about, passed out, I woke up about 3 a.m., and uh, turn off the TV, and I used I did this often. My I had my bottle was about half full, and I got the bottle, and I crawled on my hands and knees through the living room, through the bedroom to to go to bed, which some people would call pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I just called it going to bed, you know. Um, <laughs> it um, this one night, I thought it was I thought it was kind of smart actually. I remember the first time I thought of it, I thought, hey, you can't fall off the floor, and so. Uh, I got into my bedroom, and I stood up to get undressed, and I fell. As soon as I stood up, I lost my balance. I fell on my knees, spilled this whiskey all over the bed, and I picked up the bottle real quick, and there was some left there, but most of it was in the bedspread. So I, I grabbed the bedspread, and I started sucking whiskey out of it. Butch alluded to it last night. He had a friend who sucked whiskey out of his sheets. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm so honored. <laughs> And I'm sucking whiskey out of this bedspread, and a voice in my head says, Hey, man, that ain't right. <laughs> you uh, you thirsty? There's whiskey in the bottle, man. Not, um, no, I'm not thirsty. I'm frugal. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll waste my life, but I'm not letting Irish whiskey evaporate in the bedspread overnight. But I looked at what I was doing. I thought, my God, I've been going to AA for eight months. And I have not learned how to not suck whiskey out of a bedspread. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do about it. I was lost, alone, and out of ideas. And I thought, maybe I'm one of those guys that can't get this thing. Maybe I'm one of those people. The book says there are people that can't get this. Maybe I'm, I, I couldn't believe that because I know I'm a smart guy. I've always been able to do just about anything I set my mind to, but I can't seem to get sober. And I didn't. I did a dumb thing. I said, "God, if you're there, please help me." I absolutely meant it. It was a sincere prayer of surrender. But I did not believe for one second that anybody was listening. I just was out of ideas. Went to bed and I went to sleep. And over the next couple of weeks, every single day, something strange would happen. I go to my neighborhood liquor store. Somebody from AA behind the counter. You know, I'm in a, a restaurant across from NBC. Um, and I started to have lunch over there, and I started to order a margarita, and the waitress is somebody I know from AA. I'm walking through the Vons Market in the liquor department, reach up for a bottle. Somebody from AA is pushing a cart towards me. Hey, one day at a time, keep it simple. It's a beautiful life, isn't it? Uh, and, uh, but this is happening to me every day, and it happened for two weeks. And it, and it wasn't any, you know, parting of the Red Sea. Uh, but but it, it's happening every day, and it didn't keep me from drinking, but it's happening every day, and you, and you can't not notice it. So after a couple of weeks of this, I'm on the way to work at 6.30 in the morning, and I just killed a half pint of Bushmills. I don't keep empty bottles in the car. They're illegal and useless, you know, so I... I uh, <laughs> I roll down the window and I toss this bottle just as a guy from AA is driving towards me at 6.30 a.m. And he saw me and waved just as I tossed that bottle in front of his car. Bang, delang, bang. And I saw him go, whoa. And uh, I thought, where are these people coming from? God, they're like, they're like cockroaches. Where have we seen a person fail? <laughs> It's like those stupid miracles they talk about in the, in the meetings. 
No. Really? <laughs> and I pulled the car over to the side of the road. As soon as I thought the word miracle was like I could hear God laughing. <laughs> <laughs> And I sat there in that car that morning on the way to work. And I remembered that I had been on my knees and said, God, if you're there, please help me. And like a slideshow, every day since then went by me. Somebody from AA between me and a drink. And I, uh, I re uh, it didn't scare me. It could have scared me, but it just set my, my mind at ease. And I came to believe. I sat there in that car that morning. I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And I still believe that's going to happen any day now. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not in any hurry. I got a sponsor. My sponsor hadn't told me to read the big book, so I was just going to meetings and listening to people share what they, they read in the big book, and then I would repeat it, you know. And <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a dangerous thing to do because sometimes people misquote the big book. And this lady said... Uh, you know, the book says that our drinking was but a symptom of deeper underlying causes and condition. That's not exactly a direct quote. By the way, I quoted the book tonight. If anybody catches me misquoting the book, uh, give me a call, 818-353-4607. I get calls like that sometimes. and uh, Or sometimes people just say, yeah, I'm a long long haul truck driver. I'm driving on the I-40 and listening to your CD, and I just want to see if that's your real number, 818-353-4607. <laughs> And uh, but um, this lady said, our, 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 <laughs> our book says our drinking was but a symptom of deeper underlying cause. It almost says that. So that's a pretty good para paraphrase. But then she added her own stuff just out of nowhere. She said, if uh, you don't find your deeper underlying cause and condition, you'll get drunk again. And I didn't know it wasn't out of the book because I'm not reading it. And I said, I don't know what my deeper underlying cause and condition started shining the spotlight over my drinking career, trying to find out what it was. I told you I didn't come from an alcoholic family. I didn't drink till I was 18. I don't know what my deeper underlying cause. And I thought, oh, my God, when I was 24 years old, I got hired to do a show. Uh, what happened was I I, uh, I went to see a show called Hair. There's a, a, a musical comedy out of Broadway called Hair, and it opened in L.A. at the Aquarius Theater, and I went to see it. And I love musical comedies. I mean, I love my rock and roll and my blues, but I'm crazy about musical comedies, too. It's just something magical about them. And I went to see Hair, and it was like a musical comedy about hippies with rock and roll music and nudity and crazy dancing, you know, and drugs. And I just, oh, my God, I fell in love with it. There was a character named Berger that swung on a rope and stripped down to a loincloth and made fun of the audience, and I thought, I could do that. So I called the Aquarius Theater the next day, and I said, hey, I want to be in, in your show. So the receptionist, she said, just a minute, I'll connect you. And she, I don't think this can happen today. Today they'd say, well, have your agent contact us or whatever. But in 1969, it was a different world. She said, just a minute, I'll connect you. She connected me to the company manager. He said, can I help you? Yeah, I want to be in your show. He said, can you sing and dance? I said, yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do for a living. And he said, I never danced a step in my life, but I, I could sing. So uh, I, he said, well, uh, what are you doing uh, Friday at 1 o'clock? I said, you tell me. He said, you got an audition. What's your name? I told him. And he said, get a piece of sheet music and be here at 1 o'clock on Friday. You got an audition. Cool. It's Wednesday afternoon. I went right down to the music store and bought a piece of sheet music that I like to sing. Went home and practiced all night. All day Thursday, I got my guitar out. I'm practicing this song I'm going to sing because it's got to be just right, you know. Mostly I think I was afraid that they'll go, well, he can't dance, but it will, you know, but he sure can't sing. So, um Anyway, Friday morning, I got my guitar out, and I'm practicing this song, and I broke a string on the guitar. And it's hard to explain now, but hippies were like, oh, bad karma, dude. You know, so um, <laughs> I put it down. I went into my roommate's room to see if he had the string I needed, and he, and he did. It was right in the middle of his dresser, a little envelope, D string. <laughs> Good karma, dude. So uh, I picked it up. Under the envelope was a little white capsule, which I, and we didn't have a PDR, you know, I Hmm. You had to swallow test everything. It's a good test. Uh, forget about automotive vehicles and heavy machinery. If you eat it, you're going to know exactly what it does. So uh, this turned out to be THC, a synthetic marijuana, and a nice little psychedelic. So 45 minutes later, when I got down to the Aquarius Theater, I remember I pulled up on my Harley, and I had my sheet music in my throttle hand, and I put the kickstand down, and it seemed like it took me about three or four minutes to swing my leg over, you know, like... 
oh, and I sort of floated up the stairs at the aquarium and uh, oh, yeah, and my hair was long over my shoulders and just swished when I walked, and I had these hip hugger bell bottoms on, big elephant bells, you know, and, and no shirt on. I had a vest with six layers of foot-long red, white, and blue leather fringe. Woo, yeah, it was a walking wind chime, and uh, I, uh, I got out of there. Got up, I'm standing at the back of the auditorium and I'm watching people audition and it's like, these hippies can sing and dance, man. And uh, I almost forgot why I was there and they said, Doug Rowell, is Doug Rowell here? Yeah, and I went running up on stage <clears throat> and uh, handed my sheet music to the piano player and uh, he picks it up, a big smile, and he starts to play. Bum, 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 bum. I said, wow, I feel good. And I went into this James Brown number. I thought I was the godfather of soul. And I'm down on one knee and I'm back up. And when I hold you, and I was like, and I finished, bump, 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 wow, you know, and, and the people were judging the auditioners, <laughs> nudging each other. And they were all smiling. And the guy said, we love you, man. We love your energy. Uh, can you do something a little mellower just so we, you know, get a range of uh, your voice? I said, no problem. So I went into this a cappella version of Otis Redding's Dock of the Bay. And the piano player knew the tune, and he picked it up, and we were right in the pocket, you know. <laughs> Looks like nothing gonna change. And I made myself cry. And, uh, <laughs> they said, great, man, we love you. Just got to see a dance. So I, I said, okay, hit it. By this time, I'm, you know, I'm in, in, in the groove. I, I said, hit it. The guy started to play, and I started to move, and I probably looked like the offspring of Joe Cocker and Julia Louis-Dreyfus, you know, at first. <laughs> but I, I see my hair coming around, <laughs> getting trails off of my hair, and I see the fringe on my vest. <laughs> And I'm in this tornado of trails, and I heard somebody say, Jesus, can he dance? <laughs> Alcohol and drugs doing for you what you can't do for yourself. So uh, they hired me, not for the L.A. show. I thought I was auditioning for the Hollywood show. They were, they were auditioning for the Vegas show. So they told me to show up in Vegas uh, a couple of days later, and I did. And... Uh, I learned the show in a couple of days, and then they gave me the understudy of the, one of the lead roles, and then we played Vegas for six months, and when we left, they gave me the lead role, Burger, the obnoxious, speed freak, sex crazed leader of the tribe. You know? Yeah, it was a stretch, but I could do it. And uh... <laughs> and uh, we toured the United States and Canada for three and a half years. And then we'd, uh, at the end of the show, we'd start out in the audience, then we'd come up on stage, and that's the way the show started. And they'd, uh, and they'd sing the Aquarius, you know, when the moon is in the seven. You know who sang the, the Aquarius solo? Meatloaf. <laughs> and, uh, so I, it was a fun life, you know, on the road with all these hippies, and, and, uh, we'd bring the audience up on stage afterwards, you know, and, and, uh, People would come up and say, hey, listen, we own a bar down the street. We want you guys to come and be our guests for a drink free all night long. We'd go and, and uh, you know, some somebody would come up, hey, man, you like pot here? Osley, purple. I mean, here's a, a, a <laughs> sense of me, a Maui, Waui, Panama, red, Acapulco, gold. Give us all this great dope. You like acid here? Osley, purple haze, orange sunshine, window pay, nay, 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 nay. And, and uh, <laughs> some girl would come up and go, oh, my God, oh. Oh my God, I love you. I love you. Take me. <laughs> okay, you know, it's so, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, traveling around the country and getting paid for it. Union scale. It was a good job, really. Um, but I looked back at it from my newfound sobriety and I realized that how I had been used. And, uh, <laughs> you don't realize that how, how you're being victimized when you're in the middle of it, you know. <laughs> they made me a drug addict and an alcoholic. I called my sponsor. I said, hey, I found it. He said, what would you find now? My deeper underlying cause and condition. Oh, yeah, let's hear that, Doug. I, I, uh, <laughs> I said, hair. <laughs> well, that's easy. We'll just cut your hair. Then that ought to keep you soap. Not my hair. The show hair. Remember I told you I was a big star and traveled around the country? And he said, oh, yeah, I forgot about the big star thing because, you know, because you're a drunk now. And uh, <laughs> he said, but I thought you were, you were loaded when you auditioned for that show. 
you know, I told him too much. Uh, and uh, I said, yeah. And he goes, most people, non-alcoholic people, when they go to interview for a job they really want, won't take a drug they can't identify. And that sounded just so right. I said, okay, I accept that. And he said, so uh, I'm going to say you had a problem when you got that job, so that's not the source of your problem. Don't worry about your deeper underlying cause and condition. I don't know what mine is either. If you want to look for it, fine. I'll give you something to do between meetings. Meanwhile, go to a meeting tomorrow. Call me tomorrow. Read the book tomorrow. I said, he had never told me to read the book. Read the book tomorrow. Read the whole book tomorrow. No, I want you to start reading that book every day. If you can't read a chapter, read a page. If you can't read a page, read a paragraph. That may be the best advice I've ever gotten since I've been sober. If you can't read a chapter, read a page. If you can't read a page, read a paragraph. I've been reading that book. I must have read it a hundred times by now. I've taken other people through this book. The directions are in there, you know. Uh, and they change stuff in there, don't they? Stuff you've read uh, last year, you read it again. Oh, dude, I never saw that before. Uh, and uh, and I started to, I started to get this thing, you know, and give it away. And uh, and I came to I came to know a God of my own understanding. Here, I was at a meeting in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and I heard just a great thing. There was a the people in Lake, Lake Charles, Louisiana, about a third of them talk with that beautiful Cajun accent. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's an interesting part of the country. The black and white accent, Cajun accent, sounds exactly the same. And uh, uh, that, I went to this men's stag there on a Saturday morning. And the guys were sharing. I thought it was great sharing. And then when this one old timer said, uh, you know, I got to see. You boys are scared me today. Uh, the day, at this morning, everybody talking about God in here. And I tell you, when I was new and I come in here, if everybody would be talking about God, I would be right out the door. And one of the new guys said, where would you go? <laughs> well, where would you go? Where are you going to go? My friend, my friend Bill C. says, uh, you will never go anywhere in your life and hear somebody say, AA sent me here. You know, that's the, <laughs> this is the end of the road. But what an end of the road, you know. If you're new and you're wondering, what is this idiot talking about, about the music of Alcoholics Anonymous? I think it's a, there's a rhythm and a harmony and a melody that runs through this thing, and I think it's the laughter. We come in here sick unto death and dying and feeling like we'll never laugh again. What's so damn funny anyway? You know, I'm dying over here and everybody's laughing. And you stick around a while and you hear somebody laughing and you realize it's you. How many times have I heard somebody say, I heard somebody laughing, and I realized it was me. And we laugh ourselves weller than we were before we got sick. Sometimes I, I've had this gift for so long and given it away so many times that sometimes I, I take it for granted. But what an incredible gift. We come in sick unto death and dying, feeling like we'll never laugh again, and we start to laugh and laugh ourselves weller than we were before we got sick. That's an incredible gift. And yet there are people in rooms like this all over the country. There's somebody in this room tonight who will be handed this gift and say, no thanks, I'd rather get loaded. And nobody understands that decision more than the people in this room. But if you're new tonight, you don't have to be that one. You can be the one that gets a sponsor, does all the stupid crap they tell you to do that you know is not going to work, just, and just do it, just to prove to them it's not going to work. <laughs> and see what happens. See if you don't stay sober a while. If you stay sober a year, we'll give you a cake. You know, thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.